What's going on, YouTube? It's one only Knox Hill, and I have a very, very special guest here today, the traveling Shakespearean MC Bard. It is none other than the man, the myth, the legend, Ren himself. Ren, how are you doing today, man? I feel humbled by that introduction, man. The travel, I like the traveling Bard. I think that's a good one. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm, um, I was, I was going to say like a, qu a quick disclaimer. I've, I've, I've put, been put on some new meds, which is just a short cycle. So my brain is a little bit foggier than usual. So I might have to sit and really think about things. And if things come, okay. come out a little bit jumbled, that's why I'm not just an idiot. Although partly that as well. <laughs> Hey, listen, somehow uh, people watch us, people follow us. I feel like yeah. I'm an idiot every single day when I turn the camera on, but it, uh, it is what it is. Yeah. So first and foremost, right? I have stuck in my head right now. Boom, ba, and I just kind of want to jump into okay. with concepts like that, right? Mm. Animal flow. Mm. You have some Orwellian shit going on. You have some higher level concepts going on. You've got really cool things caked into the production with the animal sounds. I've been informed that you have actually watched my reaction to your video, which is kind of wild. And yeah, I think you've watched like the whole damn thing. So that's yeah. crazy. But one thing I want to get into is what is the starting point? Is it concept first? Is it you have an idea for a melody or something going on with the production? Is it you just kind of start writing and then you start to let the lyricism guide you? Like where is where is the origin story for conceptual songs like this and tracks? Because you can do it all. You know, it's not like you're just rapping. You can sing. You do the instrumentation yourself. You do the producing. So I'm curious which hat comes on first. So f first, it's kind of like taking a bird's eye view. It's like at the top is the overarching overarching concept of what i want yeah. to achieve with that album or that particular thing and a big thing a big part of it for me was um was realizing and looking at countercultures right so we had the summer of love you had the punk movement you had the hip hop movement yeah. which is a big part of the civil rights movement you had the rave scene over in england which was kind of like on the tail end of a depression and thatcherism and stuff like that and people just wanting to feel connected and i, I think what yeah. i found very bizarre is since the rave scene as far as i can i'm aware there wasn't a a such a strong unified counterculture as such which is strange because we've lived as people of the world we've lived through so much weirdness in the past decade mm. particularly crazy things but the, the advancement of technology is crazy but then living through a pandemic living through uh what i can see if i step out is a little bit more hyperpolarization. and i always found it was quite strange and i was like what why like what 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 is it is it that we're now so interconnected that it's gone the other way that makes counterculture more difficult to achieve i don't think that's the case so I suppose my what I really wanted to achieve in an overarching theme was contributing. If if I'm if I'm lacking it in music and I'm and I'm and I'm craving it, then it's like wow, I'll just start doing it then. Because uh, and, yeah. and 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 so so for me that was it was a really important part of the overarching concept. And then when it comes down to like an ev individual song, um, it, it, with with that sentiment in mind, it's just different every time. With that song, it just started with a tom drum. I was just I just got in the studio. I had this tom drum, do, 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 yeah. do, 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 and I was like, record that. And so I was working with this, this guy, Aled, at the time, the sound engineer, and, and I was just like, oh, let's put that down. And we, we recorded that, and then uh, that was just the foundation, and then everything grew from that, you know, like messing around with bass sounds and just manipulating them and messing them up, and then... Um, uh, I can't even remember the name of the song now. There was this hap there was this hardcore dance tune back in the nineties. It was like boom da. I think it's literally called like boom da or something like that. And it had this like doom 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 beat, and it's like boom da ba da boom ba da. And it's got this spoken. And I just thought it was so cool. So I was like, you know what? I want to do a chorus like that, where it's like it's not quite beatboxing, but it's also not quite rapping. It's just like melodic talking. Um, so yeah. we, so so we had that idea for the hook, and then and then it just kind of grew from there. And, and what I like to do lyrically is just flow find the concept the seed of the idea and then make sure that all the lyrics fit that theme uh, and, and this one was yeah. just it, it was just this sort of animalistic jungle theme and um yeah. it wasn't actually tied to all well until we started putting the video together actually right yeah really that's really interesting because i i always pictured that you had elements of orwell in your head because of animal farm mm. uh like like you had the seven commandments and everything throughout the visuals but i just thought it just made so much sense so that's pretty dope that you kind of retroactively went back yeah and then inserted that to fit with that vibe because yeah if you if you look at the lyricism itself you're right like the way that you wrote 
I've done Money Game uh, Part 1 and 2, so I know like when you want to get like really in-depth on issues, you can get in-depth. But yeah. it definitely felt like here was more metaphorical, symbolic stuff, not necessarily getting in-depth. So therefore it sets up exactly for... exactly because some some songs you you just get very very matter of fact about it and, and like money yeah. game as well it, it kind of just breaks it down as to what what it is it, whereas something like this is a bit more ambiguous and it can be taken on surface yeah. level and if it's taken on surface level it's just like flexing basically and it's just like i'm yeah. the king of the jungle and stuff like that and then you can dig a little bit deeper into it and 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 i think one of my favorite things about art is and one of my favorite things about watching reaction videos like yourself or anyone's reaction videos is it it makes somebody put their own meaning on what it is and even if that wasn't yeah. necessarily your intent it, it creates a conversation it creates a thought and i think that's the beautiful thing is that like um it, i always thought modern art was shit and and until i started thinking like <laughs> until i started thinking about the perspective like you could walk into a room and there's just a chair and you're like what the hell is that chair doing there like come yeah. on why has this person been given a lot of money for this and then but but then that's not really that's not really the point it's the, the point is the observer what is the observer yeah thinking even my reaction of going that's crap is in a reaction and it's like and that, i guess that's the point it's like things are only really as valuable as the value that we give them as people like even even with money it's all arbitrary it's all comes from our ideas at the end of the day so what however we value something is just a decision at the end of the day and the same same is true with art so somebody could look at those lyrics and go for animal flow and go just it's just this fucking this white dude flexing about <laughs> or someone could look at it and go actually this this has a deeper meaning about society and counterculture and and both are true <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the beautiful thing yeah well i mean you talk about objective reality versus subjective reality and i think you hit on a very good point there especially with music and art in general and like you know i get into arguments i get into discussions on this channel all the time about stuff and people want to try to objectify music but to me you know, it, music is whatever you take away from it. And I completely agree with that. Like when I've written songs and like I see a reactor have a different interpretation to it, that doesn't mean that that interpretation is invalid. No, 100%. You know what I mean? Like like if that's how they connect with it and mm. that's their emotional connection and that's what that song gives them, yeah. then yeah, you know, we all kind of write in that way. And, and, you know, writing language in the poetry of music is different from everyday conversational language, you know? 100%. So that's the beauty of the poetry of music is that it can be interpreted in so many ways. Mm. And, you know, it sounds to me like, especially with you, the more I'm starting to do your discography, the more I'm starting to learn that there is definitely a, a wide spectrum of sort of topics that you like to dive into and discuss. It's not just flexing bars or flexing tracks oh, like yeah. you get a lot of MCs do. You like your political commentary. You like your, your societal commentary. You storytell as well. So, how do you organize all this chaos in your head? Because it seems like there's a lot of shit going on up here creatively, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I don't really. Well, I, I think that's that's why, uh, as well, stylistically, this album was a bit of a challenge for me because of everything that I've put together before that that's like been a body of work has been quite eclectic in terms of the the genres and styles because um, yeah. Yeah, that may have something to do with ADHD. It may just be the way that my brain works, you know, because I think that everyone's on some sort of spectrum with these things. Um, so, yeah, in terms of organizing it, it's really just finding, it's just finding that theme. And once I found the theme, I can roll with it. And and I think the the, the thing for me at the moment is is because I've been, it, it, it's it's difficult to, everyone just wants to put you into a box and so when you write something quite yeah. poignant and take your time really writing something poignant this is this is just me very very straightforward about this like so when i wrote high run i wrote high run after this whole album uh, so and i've been sitting on these tracks for n almost a year basically we i actually finished recording animal flow last year uh a year and a half ago now actually but like so i've just been wow. sitting on this for a while so it, it's funny because then you sort of evolve as an artist and and and, then I, and I put high run out and i was like these because it was so, I suppose, it, it related and touched the nerve with so many people and I put so much effort into making sure each line was really meticulously planned through. Something like Animal Flow, just being honest, I didn't really do that. I just wrote it for fun. I was just like, this is this is, yeah. this is f something fun to do. And then people people try to look for poignancy because they expect it, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, yeah. almost, it's almost this case of like imposter syndrome in a way because you're like, I, but 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 then I was trying to step, and I, I was talking about this to my mate, mate Tarek. I was like, yeah, I just, I'm just not, I just almost want to scrap everything I've done and just start writing things that are on the same caliber as that because that's what people came, a lot of people have come to find my work through. And, and um, he was just like, mate, you're being stupid because like, even if unintentional, there are still things that are coming through that that, yeah. that, 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 that could 
you know mean stuff to people and so uh, yeah i need to just kind of get over my perfectionism with this i think yeah yeah well again you talk about intention versus interpretation but also not to discredit yourself i mean you still had to throw like the seven fucking commandments in there. You had to throw in all these little Easter eggs and stuff yeah, but, visually. So there's so, still that poignancy. Well, this is, this even is, though even even though you might discredit some of the the song itself, and then it's not hard to make those connections from the different animal themes throughout and those metaphors to to what you did. You well, know what I mean? That's the thing. Like, so so I, I for me personally, like finishing the song is fifty percent of the song, and then and then the video yeah. the video because I, I I'm always putting together uh, and directing these videos, and then Sam is just a genius, um, it was actually Luke on this one, but I, I usually work with Sam, but Luke, the same thing, just very, very clever at, I just, I tell them my ideas and they, they bring it to life yeah. very, very well. And, um, but yeah, I mean, the video for this one, that's where I started getting really excited because there's so much we hid in that video, just just like yeah. little little things. And the more you start coming up with one thing, then it just excites you to like, go, oh, what else can we do? And with those one yeah. takes particularly, cause it's like, how much can we pack into this? little journey this little visual journey yeah i think too like you know it, it's interesting because obviously i'm not just a reactor i'm an artist too so i get to see things from my perspective and then relate them to you like even when i'm doing songs for instance that let's call them like more shallow type of songs right they're yeah. just more like let's just have fun with it i write them a lot quicker than i do some of these like storytelling songs some yeah. of these deeper songs but i still like operate under kind of the premise like if i'm going to make an entertaining song i'm still going to try to do it in a different way than how the mainstream is flooding it with. You know what I mean? Like, even though you had, let's call it, yeah, you had fun with it, it's a party song, like you still beatbox in it, you still found all these animal noises, you still said, you did something creatively mm. that is still different to what the normal palette is consuming along the same subject lines, along the same subject matter, if yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And I, I, just lo I just love doing that as well. I mean, it's just, and, and that's the thing, like people are, we're not just serious all the time. We're not introspective all the time. Sometimes we're just with our mates joking and having fun. And I feel like, because yeah. sometimes you read comments, you probably got the same thing. It's like, oh, well, this doesn't, this isn't quite like that one. And it's like, yeah, but yeah. of course it's not. Because like, we are such a, like, a rich tapestry of different things. That's what makes us people. And I feel like music should be allowed to be that as well. You know what I mean? Like if I want to yeah. do, if I want to do a heavy metal song next week, Fuck it, why not? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like screaming down the mountain. Like, do it. Because, because it, it's true to that moment. And it's, and it's like, yeah, I, I, I just, and that's why I think, that's why when I was thinking about it more, I'm like, no, I just need to get over this. Like, I need to get over this, like want for everything to have to hit yeah. on this like huge, oh my God, what did I just watch level? I was just like, nah, that, nothing like life isn't like that. Life isn't full of these, no. just like moments after moments after moments of big moments. It's just like, they're they're weaving in in between all these. Little, so I was like, yeah, fuck it. If I want to do something fun, then do something fun. I've I find too like the second someone tries to put me in a certain box, I'm like, okay, fuck it. I'll go all the way over here and swerve <laughs> yeah, yeah, in this yeah. direction just to show you that you I'm not gonna be boxed in. And you're right, life life is a spectrum, isn't it? Like we all have moments when we're down, when we have our dark places. We have moments in our highs and our joys and everything. So yeah, you know why not be versatile with the music that you put out to reflect all those different aspects of life and just being human. Yeah, and it, and it keeps it exciting as well. It keeps music exciting. If you, I, I've never my my philosophy with this is I never want to go. Oh no, I've got to go and make a song. I never ever want to feel like that. I always want to feel like, it's like, I feel like I put in the cheat code in life now because like people, I've made this a career somehow. And like, I love, I love that because creativity, no matter if it's music, film, whatever it is, but I just love creating something new out of everything that already exists. Yeah. So, yeah. Speaking of uh, creativity, I've got a question for you. Okay. In terms of your writing process, do you ever step back and think about how this will be digested or consumed like 10 years from now 20 years from now like do you do you write in a way to try to make it timeless or do you feel like timelessness will just come naturally through the art itself if that makes <sighs> sense i think i think so the only the only time that that's really on my spectrum of awareness because i try not to think too much in the future during the creative process yeah. because I, d I try i almost don't want to uh, taint it too much by a by a an, an outcome. I don't want it to be outcome mm. dependent. I don't want to be like this song is going to be a hit. I, I don't. I don't ever really want to feel like that. And I and I want to feel like everything in the moment that I'm creating is my favorite thing that I've done in that moment. Um, yeah. Like otherwise, it, there's no point in existing for me anyway. But like, but in terms of that, the only time I've really thought of that are, are during more sung songs like ballads or stuff like that because I just feel like 
there's something about a sung ballad that you can just go back. Like when I go back and listen to like oh it's redding or like or like these old uh, james wow. songs or like it's just like you can listen to that it's like it's like amy winehouse will be timeless it's like i know i know real and, and they also sit across a lot of tastes like because a lot mm. of people could be like hardcore hip-hop purists and then listen to like a bill withers and just be like god man this is so good you know what i mean like and, and for me when it, yeah, it's when I'm approaching songs like that. That's the only time it really comes into my head. Like, oh, I really want to make something that someone could listen to, maybe twenty years down the line. I don't, I don't tend to do it so much with with my hip hop stuff, but who knows? Like, you n you never really know what what that will be because maybe when they were doing the old soul sort of stuff started popping off and that scene started happening with all the greats back then, they 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 thought it was very new and exciting that people wouldn't be listening back in years yeah. to come. But well, here that's we true. Are. I, I guess the thing is like. I, I think about it sometimes right like especially if i'm dropping like a lot of specific like current day events references I, I don't know just it just depends on on the song itself but with rap we say so much more in our words don't we like we just have so much more opportunities for lyricism yeah and rap is rap is current you know rap is about oftentimes the bubble in in the here and now so i think it's kind of more difficult versus a, a ballad mm. like you discussed to, to write sort of lyricism that's more emotive that's more timeless in that sense that anyone can connect to because we get a lot more specific but also we get a lot more opportunities to talk about specific shit too, I guess. Yeah, but then, but then yeah, and, and, and I, so I suppose it's, yeah, it's just a way of stepping yourself because I, I think I, the, what I love about hip hop is that you can cram so much story into such a small amount of space. That's, that's one of my favorite things about it is like, and also just the wordplay, like I'm in love with, it made me fall in love with the English language. I wasn't so much into English when I was in school, but then when I started writing more, I'm just like, I love English. Like, like, I love what you can do with wordplay and metaphors and similes. And, oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're very poetic. Like, you know, you talk about like internals, the external rhymes, the way that you set up your structures, the way mm. you think about how you word and stress your syllables and unstress things. I see a lot of poetry within, within yeah. your lyricism. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's, well, that's what I love about more of the fun songs as well, is that you can, you start to dissect internal rhyme schemes within schemes and then like, be yeah. like, you'll set yourself a challenge of, right, right, I'll write the third word of this line with the third word of the third line and then the third word of the sixth line and then you'll, you'll do it, which most, like you, you get most of it. And, but like the everyday person, they they just know that it feels good. They're not, they're not like yeah. mathematically dissecting that and going, this is why it feels good. They just know that it, something's happening. <laughs> it's like yeah. keeping the flow time long. But I love that challenge of like being able to, because the challenge is you you see that you see it almost like a mathematical or color coded thing but then the challenge is how can i do this and also make it make sense within the context of the subject matter that's the, but i love that i love the challenge man yeah yeah speak all right so speaking of rap here, here's my question right on this side of the spectrum you got white boy from an all black area like yeah. i had no choice with hip-hop like hip-hop was was coming whether i wanted to or not yeah right how does a white boy out of Wales become such a cold-hearted MC? Like, where does this passion and drive for rap come into play, man? It was just, it was just me. It was just kind of leaking into my house from, and I also think that, um, and it's why, like, lyrically, I don't, I don't try in front and put on a, a place that I've never come from in my music either. Yeah. But like, it, it, it's. But I, it was still, it's still fucking. It was still wasn't an easy upbringing, man. Like you know, we 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 I came came from working class home. Mum and dad separated, um, and like, but, and I think one one thing about hip hop as well that I like is is it's kind of like fearlessness in the face of adversity. That's it. Yep. That's it for me, and 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 which transcends adversity can come in any shape or form or any sort of size. Oh, yeah. and, and and I definitely experienced a lot more of it from uh, 19 until I was about 30 but like I don't know it was just more like when I when I was younger and, and I heard like like Method Man Eminem and the Dre 2001 album there was just something that instantly clicked I was just like I just instantly liked it uh, uh, and yeah. uh, Rage Against Machine as well to get more and oh, move more into yeah. sort of political like Zach, Zach De La Rocha's, I think he never really makes the top 10 list of anybody's but he's definitely in mine man he's, he's such a fucking he's such a good MC but um yeah, it, it was just like, it just, whatever it was about it, I think it was like the frustration or just like that that feel of like being empowered and standing up to yeah. a feeling of frustration or discontentment with your surroundings. And um, it's that, it's that renegade spirit. Yeah. That, that rap has always had. And I get that renegade spirit from you and your lyrics. I mean, look, there's a reason why it's one of the number one selling genres in the world because 
you know, everybody goes through struggles. And mm. and like you said, coming from working class, parents split, I mean, odds are already against you in the first place. Mm. And and rap is like spitting in that face of adversity, isn't it? And then yeah. obviously all of your health issues and all the other shit that you've been through. Yeah. So, I mean, all right. So, so you start listening to rap, right? You start getting into method. You start getting into M. You start getting into rage. But... There's listening to it, right? And then there's doing it. So so at what point in your musical arc do you all of a sudden go, yo, I'm gonna start fucking rapping? Like this is this is my thing now. It was it, it was necessity, right? Because I started I started producing music when I was really young. I started producing when I was twelve. I was just like, this is I, when I was like from ten until then, I, I just I used to carry this little tiny guitar with me, just like it was like a little beaten up little thing that my dad gave me and I was like it would come everywhere I went and then like at one point I was just like I, I need to make beats because I saw I went, my, yeah. my parents were like massive hippies and they took me to this like these these festivals every um summer with beautiful things yeah. man where just it was just like full of loads of really open-minded people and um but there, there would be like this rave night where they would play drum and bass. The dr I don't know how much you're into drum and bass scene, but here like jungle and drum and bass in the UK where you yeah, are. Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Huge. I'll tell you not not necessarily uh Full on like drum and bass, but like UK hip hop, the first really got me interested on that side of things. Have you heard of Mike Skinner in the streets? Yeah, like, of course, man. Mike Skinner, bro. That that the the um uh, original pirate material for me was fuck yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was one of my favorite albums growing up. I, I'd, I'd actually say that that was probably just as influential as like the Marshall Mathers LP um, in terms of getting into and and Andre two thousand and one in terms of getting the the beats and the the lyricism on it. But like Mike Skinner, I think is. A genius and what i loved about him is there was no he was what he was he was a geezer mate from from the from the east end whatever i, I actually have things from up north maybe but but what the, the the his his uh the way he was putting it out there was just like it was just so it wasn't anything other than him and it was like relatable because yeah. he's talking about going to a pub on a friday night chatting up birds ending up in the kebab shop at four in the morning he talks about like being like 45th generation roman i'm like yeah what? the fuck kind of bars we dropping it's, here man it's like, so it's so british and that's what i loved i was like you don't have to i don't have to be anything other than what i am right now in this yeah. and and, and, that, and that was like a quite an enabling thing and um so yeah anyway i got into that i started producing and i was like ah, oh, i need to find an mc because like i can't do it and but i'm i'm, I'm a, like a little kid i'm a 12 year old kid in wales yeah like no one's uh, other than like the glc not not i don't know if you ever heard of glc but like not many rap artists came out of wales and um and i couldn't find anyone to do it so i just started doing it myself and i, I was very bad at the start and, and i just it was just kind of like persistence and uh, I, I just keep on doing it and doing it and doing it and then you know, like you've probably done the same thing. You know, like you'll be in your mate's car and you put on an instrumental and you're just freestyling for fun. Yep. I did it yep. so many times. Like that that's what All we'd be time. doing. We'd just be driving around or you go into a party and there'd be someone and you'd have like rap battles and you'd be like 13, yep. 13 years old at the time. So probably yep. bad, but or your boys are hyping you up and they're like, oh, that's a bird. And, and you're, you just, you're, and you're fucking get, awful. Yeah. You're fucking awful. But, 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 and that's what we used to do. And you know? we'd all like sit in a circle and just freestyle about everyone. And, and that's yep. kind of, I just love that part of the the culture of it. It was just like mm. expression, and then you just and and then with time it just gets easier, and you you become better, and you start looking into why flow sound good, and and you start dissecting people like Method who just like rhythmically just bouncing on a beat, and you're like, okay, what's going on here? Like, why do I like this? Yeah. And, and then trying so to we're, we're we're from a similar era, so like during that time as we're growing up, remember when Eight Mile came out. And obviously Eminem's huge. And then everybody was about that battle rap culture. And yeah, yeah. that just really brought shit on, didn't it? Everybody wanted to freestyle, wanted to battle rap, and it just accelerated from there. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I yeah, I, I, I that was that was really it, man. And, and and like it was just so I just found it so fun. That was it. Yeah. 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 At 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 what point after so now you're doing it, right? Now we're walking through it. We're getting to the origin story here of of the MC known as Ren. Um when did you realize like I'm pretty damn good at this? Like I'm I, I'm gonna lay I'm gonna lay down my own vocals on these tracks now. I don't I don't need a rapper anymore. I don't need to go get someone. I even when I was laying down my own vocals on my track, it like, was just like I was just so determined. So like I'd I'd have these CDs, and this is when I, I sold my I made my first album when I was thirteen. I think I was called I was called Syndicate. 
because I I've always had this kind of like county counterculture thing. But I was called Cinder. Yeah. There, there was a game called Syndicate. I don't know if you ever played it. It was like Command yeah. and Conquer style game. It was it was sick. But anyway, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I call I call myself Syndicate, and and um, no shit. I, I had the, I had this little CD of beats that I'd make. Some of it would be like drum and bass. Some of it um would be hip hop beats. And it would just like be like this little. I was really inspired by the Prodigy back then as well. So a lot of it was quite that sort of like breakbeat mm. inspired. And because at the time, like, you know, we are old men, my friend. We allowed that the internet wasn't really a thing. So I was literally walking th around these, these festivals with a boom box, mm -hmm. putting the CD in, and I would sit down and I would like make them listen to it. I'd be like, this is my, this is my album. That'll be 10 quid, please. That's 10 pounds. Yep. And, 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 and I just like try, and, and if, if I sold like four or five in a day for a 13 year old, that's like crazy money. So I'm like, I am balling. Yeah. I've got my 40 pounds. I'm off to the shop. I'm buying, I'm stocking up on these sweeties, man. And, um, so so that 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 was it was really just like i don't know in terms of like I, I think i was quite disconnected as to good or bad it was just more just like obsession and i had to do it, it mm. so I, so it wasn't really like i'm the shit listen to this it wasn't really like that i was just like i'm proud of this listen to this you know what i mean yeah yeah well you were you were doing it all but man i mean we we are getting old aren't we the the cd days i remember having having the trunk man Right. Yeah. We had the trunk. We had the CDs in the trunk. We popped the trunk open. We had the system playing out of the trunk. We had our own songs playing or sometimes we put on the beats and we just be sat there on the corner just rapping to the beats like, yo, yeah. this is us just holding up the CD. And that was that was the self promotion, man. That's the hustle, was, mate. That's the hustle. That was that was the hustle. All right. So speaking of the hustle. Right. So you're promoting yourself. You're going around festivals. Where is the next step? Because I saw somewhere that uh, you were signed by Sony, weren't you? So it, the next, it really came from. Um, and, that, and that's when you were younger too. I mean, so we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the timeline. So this was before I got, this before my illness started happening. But um, I was, yeah, I was about 18 or 19 um, and I was busking because uh, I started, but I was like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't really making enough money to live. But I, I the, the first and only job that I got was in um, a, su a supermarket in co-op. And um, I got um, I got can co op. Yeah, that's like that's that's like Walmart or Seven Eleven for my American audience. There we go. Yeah, but I was I was a delinquent back then, and I used to come in like on a Sunday morning, just like super hungover, just like in a different world, and then like I would just be. And, and they they noticed that I wasn't working very well. And they also had CCTV footage of me throwing sprouts, and my other mate who was working there, they, they pulled me in <laughs> and they sat me down. And they were like. What's this? And then anyway, so so I I I I didn't carry on with that job. Uh, I got politely asked to leave. And then um and then I was just like I don't want to I don't want to have to do I want I want to do music forever. Like this is what I want to do. So oh, I was yeah. like I was, I was so determined to make it work that I was like I'm gonna go busking. And when I started, it was it was quite a daunting thing. But um, it it really helped me with my performance because at the start, you, you I, I I just people observe a lot. So when I'd be playing, I'd be um. Just, just kind of watching people and trying to improve mm. how I'm interacting with people to to kind of improve my performance, and it it, yeah. so it turned from a fear into a love. Like I became so obsessed with it, like I couldn't wait to get out onto the streets. And um, it was it was then really like I, I I'd sing a lot of my own songs that I wrote, and um, yeah, even even back then I think a lot of my lyrics had this kind of feeling of counterculture to them. Um, because it was yeah. always it was always something that was quite drilled into me. I suppose because I grew up li reading a lot of. Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Kurt Vonnegut, um, j just a lot of listening to Rage Against the Machine. Listening the to Mike Rage Skinner's Against the, the Machine, world, you're gonna get counterculture, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And and it was just a big. Um, but I think beyond that, it was it was more just like this awareness and ability to stand back and and uh, I, I guess to people watching and and to notice. Uh, I don't know, uh, trying to notice where people fall short, and then also realizing within noticing that. I'm being hypocritical because I, uh, I'm, I'm guilty of the same things, and uh, within that I birthed a lot of my lyrics about this kind of complex, like analysis of like, shit. We could be doing this a lot better, or but so could I, and I'm not. So like, what's yeah. what's going on here? And 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 uh, so, so a lot of the songs that I wrote were kind of, uh, and I was singing one of these songs called "I Wish," which isn't online anywhere, but um, th this guy Eric stopped, and, and he he'd put together. Plan B, who you probably heard if you're into UK hip hop, um, so he 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 just done the defamation. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he just he just, yeah. he just come off the back of the success of the, the defamation of Strickland Banks was where Ben um, Ben Drew from Plan B he, he started doing um, more sort of soul stuff. 
And they hit it with that Motown type shit when they when they wicked. swerved into that lane. That just fucking took off. They put they put him in a suit. They that like cause ben, mate, ben was hard though. But like he 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 because he came out of a proper. You could tell he was just like rough London kid. Came out of like yeah. a rough background. And I I love this stuff, man. When I grew up, because I found Ben way before that album came out. Like Charmaine and um, Who Needs Actions When You Got Words and all that stuff. Like I was I was a big mm. big 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 fan so when eric was like oh yeah by the way i've just come off the back of this we, we got chatting he was like i love your lyrics i love to take you up to london and we would get in the studio together and then he told me the band thing and i was like i'm there <laughs> like I'm, next next train into london i'm going because like i was let's go I, I was a big big plan b fan um i i think he's i, I took a lot of inspiration from him because like things like the ill manners movie i don't know if you've ever seen that but um mm. yeah exactly like he's he's a visionary he's not just a rapper he, he does a lot of things he's a great actor he does a lot of stuff but um so i went up to london and, and, and that was kind of it that was it was a really affirming time for me because like to get somebody it, it's it's funny because of my I, I guess quite turbulent relationship with the industry it's funny because to have somebody working within those fields i mean i, I wouldn't really say eric's an industry type though he's just kind of a just a brilliant guy sick musician but almost to have that affirmation of someone working on very successful stuff being like i love your stuff it was a massive confidence boost and and it was like something in my mind i was like this is probably beyond busking on the street if i if i lean into this enough Mm. you know so um yeah that that was kind of it really that that was the thing that i was like i'm i am ready to go and i'm going like full speed ahead and the, I suppose the the bittersweet irony was it, it was really close to it was months after having that belief that I got struck down with this illness and just couldn't do anything like what, what for for years I I was I was unable to I was unable to get out of bed I wasn't able to uh, my brain would be so foggy that I couldn't write wouldn't pick up my guitar for months on end it's just like yeah because because you were mis you were misdiagnosed weren't you with uh what was it the fatigue syndrome I yeah can't, chronic can't fatigue chronic fatigue syndrome yeah 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 and then obviously late not until later on lyme disease it was discovered, exactly right? yeah so it took, you, it so took you went through seven a lot years of time of getting your whole body chemistry all fucked up and all tooled around with yeah for the wrong reasons exactly and, and that, i think that that comes across now it, it, sort, sort of the things like sick boy and stuff i think there was a lot of and even to, to this day i'm trying to find a way to release it cathartically and not in a way that's uh makes me bitter but like there was a lot of still a lot of anger for the fact that i had to take so much medication that i didn't need that had so much side effects and the, you know like and i i tolerated so much that was actually detrimental to my recovery because i i suppose and i don't blame any individuals for this because it's not mm. like I, I i wouldn't even blame the first nurse who just like was like oh maybe you're depressed yeah i was i was gonna ask do you think it's a a human error or that is a systematic error that i think led i think th- i think it's diagnosis i think it's a system systemic error and and look there's it it's it, we haven't quite nailed it yet the the beauty of public mm. health care in england is that you can go and break your arm an ambulance will come and pick you up and you won't get billed for it the beauty mm. of privatized health care is you will go in and because they're taking your money they will be compassionate and they'll spend a lot of time with you until they figure out what's yeah. gone wrong. Not always, because I've heard stories of people in America that have had just as bad problems with Lyme disease misdiagnosis and been billed for the for the for the yeah. the, 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 the honor of that. So so like it's not always the case, but I, I do think that like there needs to. I don't know. I don't know the answers to this, but it it almost mm. feels like healthcare is is an industry. It's a very complex industry because even things like patents, it's, everything is double edged sword. Like patent, of course, the person that comes up with something should be rewarded for that. But then patents also crank up the prices of medications, and and all of a sudden you have HIV prep and stuff like that costing people seven thousand dollars a year. And if they don't have insurance, then they're screwed. And and like yeah. it's so, so like there's a lot of double edged swords. And and for me it fundamentally comes down to feeling like profit within the the medical industry should almost be like somehow remodeled so that like people who are working within the medical industry, I think should be paid better than anybody in the, should be paid better than rappers, should be paid better than anyone in the world because they're, they're, they're definitely footballers, sports music, like loads of people make more than an NHS nurse makes. And, and I think that's a yeah, travesty, yeah. but like, I mean, pay, I, pay the best. You usually attract the best. That's always the way that it goes. That's all of a sudden jobs that people will strive for that they'll want to dedicate more time and effort to learning because they know that the payout at the end of it is going to be a greater reward for yeah. it. That's just, you know, simple yeah. economics on that one. But we just but I need... think... Sorry, go, go on. on. No, no, I don't want to... You go, sir. 
All right. All right. What I was going to say was, you know, comparing American to British systems, I feel like a lot of your music gives a voice to those underprivileged. Right. And the systematic thing in the States is that, yes, privatized healthcare is fantastic if you have it, if you have the money for it. But there is a large portion of our population that does not have the money for it, that cannot afford it, and that often misses and loses out because of the way that our system is set up. Whereas no matter your income level within the United Kingdom, if you have a serious issue, you're, you're going to get seen and you're going to get sorted. That's that's the difference. Yeah, al although it, it's, it's, it's a kind of grass is greener side because we're now so overstretched. If I went in for a mental health issue, I'd probably be on a years long waiting list. And then when I'm mm. seen, because of the fact that they've got like 30, 40, 50 appointments that day, it's a bit of a conveyor belt system. So they're not going to spend right. that attentive care with you. So it's, it's there's, there's pluses and negatives to both, but... To both, I think, but, yeah. But at the moment because we're in a bit of like a recession at the moment in the UK, more and more resources and because of uh, post Brexit and stuff, more and more resources are being pulled out of the NHS. And we're really seeing it. Like if you end up in A&E in, in the UK on a Friday or Saturday night, it is chaos at the moment. Like yeah. it's, it's absolutely well, chaos. Well, that's why all the nurses and doctors are now striking and you've got huge issues with that because they're demanding higher pay for dealing with this, especially the result of COVID and all that. But anyways, anyways, we're, we're, yeah. we're veering, we're getting into... <laughs> A deeper, different conversation. Yeah, what I want to, yeah. what I want to bring it back to, right? So you have this moment that's almost like a, I fucking made it, right? Because you're you're literally on the cusp of your music career and like really breaking through. You have someone who is successful who believes in you. You have a label who obviously believes in you, and it's like, I'm here. And then all of a sudden you get sick. So not only do do you lose your your health, but essentially you lose your music career. And for a lot of people, right, Ren, that's it. Like, you're not recovering from that. You, you could spiral out. I mean, you could get really depressed. I've, I've had people that have fallen out of the music industry. And yet, all of a sudden, all these years later, guess who's blown up? Guess who is absolutely taking off independently, right? So persistence fucking pays off. But how do you, how do you find your way through those waters, through, through those, you know, being so damn close to everything you ever wanted and dreamed for, and then it's snatched away from you. How, how do you keep going after that? Like, where where do you dig deep into? I think what it was was, it was a, it was a quite a similar time. Um, I was nineteen, I think, and um, so so one of my best friends who I'd grown up with since I was eight years old, like the sort of mate that you stay in their house for like a week and you're just there playing consoles together, you yeah. know, like and then like throughout school we'd like. Like it was, it was a year below me. Drift apart, come together. Drift apart, come together. But always just like mates, man, through that. And then like towards the later years, just like got even closer. And then like so, I came back from Bath one Christmas, and we were we were sitting. Um, he just gone through a few couple of consecutive breakups, and we were sitting in the pub together. And um, this was on Christmas, Christmas Eve. We were sitting in the pub together, and he was like, "Oh, I ran, man." And like, I'm just feeling, I'm feeling super down. But he was like the comedian of the group. He's he's the one that like everyone would just laugh. And he was just like, some days, some days I just want to like walk out into the water and just like, I just want to walk until until it drowns me, man. And like, mm. but he said it in such like a nonchalant way that we were just like, all right, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like he was just like very just like, because that that was his humor. It was like quite a dark humor. And then and then um, yeah, it was a couple of days later. Um, I get a call. It's like three o'clock in the morning. I get a call from my, my girl mate Ella and she's like, Ren, like Joe's on the bridge. He's just phoned me, he's just saying goodbye, he's saying it, he's saying it, um saying he's gonna jump. And um I was I was the closest person who lived to the bridge at the time, so it's three in the morning, I'm pulling on my clothes, kinda of realising the gravity of the situation. Sure. I am I'm, I'm sprinting up there, I'm dialing and and he's on he's on um He's on the phone, so I'm like, oh, thank fuck he hasn't jumped. And then like, I keep redialing as I'm, and then halfway up, mm. halfway up, I'm, I dial and it's like this number is out of service. And I'm like, fuck, you know, get the sinking feeling. I run up to the bridge. So I come from an island called Anglesey, and there's there's a there's an island connecting the mainland, and um, so and there's this big bridge that connects the two, like mm. like this big beautiful bridge, uh, uh, and there's um, even now when I look at it, it's like it's taken on a whole new meaning. But I just got there like. Probably, probably about two minutes too late, maybe. Like just, to, and and I and I was, yeah. So so like I, and and after that it was funny. Like we never we never actually found we never actually found his body. So there there was part of us for the next oh. ten 
there was, there was part of us for the next 10 days because the currents are so strong. There's a, cr there's a cross current. There, there was part of us for the next 10 days that were still holding on to the Maybe he holds on a hold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we were like, maybe Naturally. maybe there's there's a way that he, he went over. He's just like dipped. He took out some money and he's just like fucked yeah. off somewhere. So like for the next 10 days, we're, we're like putting up missing posters. We're walking up and down beaches with flashlights. We're just, we're looking for him. And um and, and then he never showed up. And like there, there, there comes a point where you have to just like accept that the, the Occam's razor, right? The most likely explanation is probably the right one. So like, yeah. so yeah, it was, it, it was tough, man. And, 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 you know, but we, we, as, as boys back home, it was such a tight knit, like brotherhood sort of friendship with all, all of us lot. So there was like 10, 15 of us who like, we'd be hanging out every day. We, we just came close and solidified. And so really when I started going through my stuff, which was really, it was really, really difficult to deal with, like, you know, losing your dreams, everything. Like I was just like, I'm not, and, and, I, and I used to get calls from Joe's mum crying, you know, early hours in the morning, um, mm. trying to make sense of it all. And I was like, I, I, can't, I can't ever put my mum through this. And I can't ever put my friends through yeah. this. You know what I mean? Like, so so that, that, was, that was mainly the thing. I think it's because I, I knew. I get that. Yeah, I get that. I, yeah man. I, I, I knew what it was from, from the person on the receiving end of that. And I, I don't blame him. I'm not angry with him. Like, he, he did what he did. It was, a, it was a rash decision. I don't actually believe that he intended to. I think it was a call for help that went wrong. But like, I, mm. I, um, I knew what that felt like. And so I was like, I don't really want to ever, no matter how hard my suffering gets, I really wanted my illness to kill me. Like, they, they, sorry to get very deep about this, but I wanted to be absolved of the responsibility because I was in so much pain. I was like, I really hope that I just die. Because then I, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, there's, there's no one, no one has to be like, feel like we could have done more. We could have said this because that's what used to go around in my head. It was like, if I'd have said this, if I'd have run quicker, if I would have like all of these things, like uh, would constantly keep, make me feel guilty almost. Like if, if that day when he told me he wanted to walk into water, I just didn't leave his side. All of those things. Like I never, and obviously with retrospect, I had no control over that situation. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. like, so that, no. that, that, and, and, and I, I learned that and I went to a lot of therapy to get over that and come to peace with that feeling of guilt. But like, I never wanted to make anyone feel that feeling of guilt that I felt. So that was the, mm. that was the thing, mate. That, that, that was, that was kind of the, the catalyst. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when I was at my, my lowest and, and really struggling with a lot of shit, um, that, that singular thought, I think, is what eventually pulled me out, was is seeing what suicide did to others. Um, and I had a, 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 really, a girl I was really close with, and um, her, her father was in the military. He suffered from post-traumatic stress. He, he didn't do very well. And I'll never forget uh, the conversation when he called her just before that was it for him. Um, and she was the last person that he spoke to. And just watching that impact on her and, and watching other people that, that I've known. And it was kind of like, I, no matter what's happening, no matter how low I feel, I'm not going to place that burden and that guilt on someone else. Because I can't, I can't bear to see them go, go through that. I, I don't want to see my family deal with it. I don't, I don't want to see my friends deal with it. So, yeah, I mean, to, to you know, take a darker, deeper path. But it... it, it was that singular thought i can completely relate to that this like just a a little bit of light i guess that that you have something to now reach towards and you, and you really feel it and i suppose it's like i, I guess you'll relate to this I, I think what makes artists is, is you you really try and understand you from somebody else's perspective so there's yes. a lot there's a lot of empathy involved and i think that empathy stopped me stop me doing it because i really wanted to yep. I, I'll, I'll be honest i wanted i wanted an easy way out because i remember saying to my mum a year into it, I was like, mum, if I have to go through a year of this again, I, I, I just, I'm just letting you know that, that there's no way I can do another year. And then two years and then three years and then four years. And, and by the time you're just like, and, and that, uh, it was really coming sort of full circle with it. That's kind of with, with high end. That's kind of what I wanted with the speech at the end. It was, that's why, that's the place that I came to when I first, when yeah, I yeah. really started enjoying life again. Like I was just like, you know what? Like, and it's also when the tide started shifting, when I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to die. Um, maybe I'm going to die before I hit 30 years old, but like, okay, that's okay. Like that, it, it just is what it is. Like some people aren't lucky enough to see five. Like, uh, yeah. and, and, and with that acceptance just came, it was just a oh, relief, man. It was a weight off my shoulders. Yeah. And, and it, the funny thing that almost sounds a little bit morbid, but it stayed with me and I just don't, 
I don't, if someone was like, a lot of people are running away from death, right? If some if something happened tomorrow, I, I'm not scared of that. Like, like I'm not scared yeah. of dying, and 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 that that stuck with me since that acceptance. It's just like, but while I'm while I'm here, I'm just trying to make the most of it now that I've lived most of my le- bed in kind of uh, most of my life yeah. in purgatory, basically, essentially. I th- I think what you really appreciate, especially being so close to death, is the value of time, mm. um, and and how. You know, we're just floating around on a rock in space and our time really is finite, you mm. know, so so make the most out of the, the time that is here. Because so many people take time for granted. They don't even realize it until it's it's too late, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. And um, also this kind of like paradox that I wrestled with of like th- th- there's a liberating feeling thinking that we are feeling like we are just insignificant little tiny blips in time. Like if you look at the timeline of, yeah. of the Earth and drop a little tiny grain of salt that will probably be the the time that we're alive on this big big scheme of thing as a species but then also as well like that's almost like quite nihilistic is that then that we're also really really important because we are alive right now and we are having this experience and there's something i don't i don't really know where my spiritual alliances lie but there's something for me quite spiritual about the fact that i am a human being having the human being experience right now so like i'm just going to go with the gut feeling of what it's telling me to do you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so have you ever that experience? Have you ever written specifically about that in a song? Or is that kind of untouchable for you music wise? Uh, which experience? Sorry, narrow it down. The, of, of, of losing, you know, one of your closest oh, friends. And the, the, the closest the, the closest thing I ever did was was um, Freckled Angels. But that was more of a homage to him. That wasn't really like that wasn't really breaking down my perspective of it. That was just what a amazing person that i thought he was and that was that was like quite that was very i wrote that i think when i was 19 and and, um it was one of those songs that just fell out onto the paper and i was crying while i was writing it and i I sung it at his funeral um uh which was really difficult to do you know singing that in front of his parents and um it was just yeah i like and and that's funnily enough that so the song's called freckled angels the um a my mate phil who, who was joe's mate as well he got he was the first person to get a Ren lyric tattooed on them. He got the whole chorus tattooed down his ribs. And oh, then, um, yeah, man. And then my mate Mikey, who was also one of Joe's best mates as well, he started a restaurant chain, which is now like one of the most successful restaurant chains back home in Anglesey called Freckled Angels. So like there was a lot of like things birthed from, um, from, from that, which from his legacy, I think, which was quite a beautiful thing. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I think when you, when you can take someone's memory and someone's legacy and then transform that into something productive i think that's the way that you really do pay homage to mm. them and, and do them justice For you real. know i mean it, and look at the the path that it led you towards and then mm. dealing with all these thoughts and then high ren is born and then we know that high ren high ren is that is the song isn't it that is yeah. really like kind of the official song that took you from like a growing quick a growing well level to just absolutely blasting off into the stratosphere yeah yeah 100 percent. that was definitely i just wanted to mention as well because i forgot this as well which i think this go on, is uh, go on. just just to go add, add into the legacy as well joe so there was joe and there was sega and there were two of my best mates and and they were my first actual fans in the world and that was the coolest thing like in terms of yep. hype people yeah because anytime i'd have a song they would be they'd know every lyric they'd sing along top mm. of their voices and actually so t- talking about belief like it, it, i just completely overlooked that but i'm glad you reminded me like it was that that actually preceded eric believing me was like having my boys like i'd write a song for you. At, at home and like next time i play it they'd know every single word and they'd also be like oh we'd be at a party drinking they'd be like ran play that song you've got to play that song yeah. and then they'd be like singing the top of their lungs and, they, and they'd just be like one day mate you are gonna you're gonna be up there like you're gonna be up there one day and that belief from like your from your boys it's, it's such a oh, yeah fuck yeah like you know my, I mean? so my boy max for instance like we we would play open mics we would do battles uh then when we started the show circuit on the east coast i mean we would be in like we'd be in the fucking hood right and we'd be like the only two white boys there but it didn't matter where the location was, if there was no one at the show, if there were, you know, if it was full of people, he never, ever missed an event. He was there every single step of the way. And, you know, that that just support and, and that loyalty from it's so the, good. The, the bonds are, are endless, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. 
Because I'm like, I like in, in the industry, I'm, I'm always a bit like against yes men. But when it's yes men and it's your boys from back home, even if you're doing something that sucks and they're hyping you up, it gives you the confidence to carry on. So in, in that regard, yeah. I believe in the yes man. Like when it's your mate. You need and that. Just, yeah, yeah. Because it just gives I, you. The- I think you, you have to have that that confidence and that self-belief because you're never going to make it in this industry. You're, you're never going to make it as an artist because we're going to hit a wall at some point in time. You know, whether it's external, whether it's internal there's always going to be walls put in our way. And I think it's just persistence. You know, it's just somehow finding the will to keep going, to keep creating content and keep trying to do your best with that content each and every time, no matter your energy levels, no matter what's going on in your life. A hundred percent, man. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what, man. So coming back, coming back to it, because yeah, sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent. I just want, I just wanted to big him up some more, man. I just wanted to shout him out some more, but, um, um, got to Joe Hughes, man, legend, mate. Um, and then, and then, um, so so yeah, would, it's funny because like I I've been I've been building up I would say a bit of a cult following up until that point like my, my you know it, it was still quite a modest following but it it was enough to be like being like this is going somewhere and, and you know this, this yeah. doing something really really cool with it like because because with with the tales of Jenny and Screech and Money Game and stuff like that, there were little moments where I just have like people really connecting to these things and then but then it was really like it started growing exponentially when I released High Run that's when things mm-hmm. that's when I was like holy crap you know like this month i've i've had more growth than i've had last year and i'm like in it's the whole year and i'm like what is what is happening right now like and and then all these crazy like people coming and hitting me up that are like people musicians that i've admired for my whole life or like actors or whatever and i'm just like fuck me like this is this is crazy it's, it's almost overwhelming to the point of being like whoa do you ever feel like do, do you ever feel imposter syndrome do you ever feel like is uh, the the only time is, the, is this uh, actually uh, happening not not so much for in terms of the um because i'm almost quite disconnected from the, the the in terms of like fame connect uh, and attention side of stuff not really because i i i i i like it because it's like i've now got a platform to hopefully make my contribution to what i think is a positive change in the world it, it might mm. it might not be right but i'm a clumsy human so i'm gonna try my best but like my the time that i get imposter syndrome is because it was exactly what i was saying before because I, I, I'm not sure if imposter syndrome is the right word, but when I put out something like, like higher end, and that's the la- that's actually the last thing that I wrote that I've released. Everything that I'm releasing now is stuff that I wrote about a year or a year yeah. and a half ago, two years ago. Interesting. So it's like it's not so much impossible. It's more just like fuck. I wish that I knew that this was going to happen in advance, so that the stuff that I'm writing now. It, yeah. it, that, but the, but then this is what I was talking to Tarek about, and he's like, "You're being stupid because like people are enjoying what you're doing, but like that they they love that." You know what you're going to give now. And yeah, there's going to be a time delay on it. But look, all of this is already successful. And you've only developed more as an artist. You've come up with new ideas, new stuff. Like, Because I, I was going to ask you about that. And then we just got into other lines of conversation. Because I struggle with this sometimes too. Like if I've created something, we both know there's a time delay. Between yeah, of course. creation to filming video to editing to preparing the marketing independently to try to figure out how you're going to push it and all that shit. So there's always a delay. It's not like we write it and then it's dropped tomorrow. It never, ever happens. But I do struggle sometimes with like having longer delays on my music because I get so impatient with it because I just, I want to share like where I'm at, like with my pen game, with yeah. my, you know, artistic level here and now. I mean, how do you, how do you deal with that? That's that, a whole nother level. Yeah. And, and it's because, because I'm mixing it and, and, and uh, like 90% of the time producing the beats as well. Um, it's, it, I, I've listened to that song to death as well. So when, when I've listened yes. to it to death, yes. oh I've recorded God, it. Yeah. I've known, I've shown loads of people it over the course of the year, and then finally I release it. It's like I'm so like over the song, <laughs> but it's so. <laughs> but what I've got to do is what, and what we've got to do, I suppose, as musicians, is you've got to f- fall in love with it again. That's why I like the reaction mm. videos, to be honest, man. Because then I'm like, I'm watching it from a, pre- a fresh perspective, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Actually, this is like you, you kind of fall in love with it again. And and um, there we go. Yeah, and that's what that's why I really like it. I, 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 I've said I said that a few times, but um, the the. The only time that it didn't happen, so like I left my management um, last, no, it was about two years ago. And um, no, no, it was whenever Power came out, I think, well, when was, I don't know, whenever, it was a few months before Power came out, um, there was this long back and forth to get out of the situation. And, but like, I was just like, 
I'm, I was feeling so frustrated with the music industry and everything that I was just like, I'm just going to make a tune. I'm not going to think about promotion. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to fucking make a tune. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to make a low budget music video with two phones and I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> and like, so, and yes. it was so cathartic. Like I smashed that song out in like a week. I like, I, I mastered it myself. I was, I was just like, and then I, I was like, Sam, we're going to do a music video where we're driving around in your car and we've got two phones and we're just like, I, and that's still today, to this day, that's one of my favorite songs I've ever released, man. It's just vibey. But, um, but I just like, yeah, I just like, I put that out there and for me, because there was no delay, because there was no promotion, there was no hype up. It was just like, here's a song. Like I really, and, and it's done quite well, ironically as well. But like, I was just like, uh, yeah, I, I, that, I really needed that. Uh, but but ever since though, so all the, basically all the songs from the Sick Boy album, I knew I was coming to Canada. I knew that I would be here for up to mm. a year, and I was like, I don't want to just like disappear off the face of the earth. I'm really glad that I thought like that because I didn't. I hadn't even written High Ran by the time I was thought, thinking about all this stuff. So if I if I'd have just dropped High Ran and then been like, and oh, now I'm out for a year, <laughs> see you later. Yeah, <laughs> like, basically I'd, you you have no buzz to keep going and I, keep the wheels turning. I suppose I would have missed an opportunity. So in a way, it's good that all this stuff's there. But I almost wish like. There was just, a, it's the perfectionist in me that was like, oh, I wish I was hitting them with some more like stuff that's like the, the caliber of like the, the tales of Jenny and Screech or the money games and stuff like yeah. that. But like I've, I've written something now because this album is only going to be 16 tracks, but now it's 17. It's because I I saw the response to Hyrule and I was like, I'm writing a song that like stands up like this. Uh, and um so it, 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 i've said this on the streams before so i can say it again like so it's money game part three i'm not going to go too much into what it is but the concept for the video it's all live it's dope the, the lyrics are my favorite lyrics that i've written on this album and yeah i'm just really excited because i was just like i need to step up to the mark because i feel unworthy yeah. I, I was I basically i was just like i feel unworthy of all this praise so i need to make something that that, that like that that was it so that's i suppose that was the imposter syndrome it's like that feeling of unworthiness because you're like i want to release something that like if, if people are throwing out compliments that I feel like are way above my, my thing, like mm. fucking Shakespeare or whatever, I've got to really step up my game to even like start like <laughs> reach slightly yeah. reaching for that. So like, I was like, yeah, I, I've got to write something like on that caliber. Yeah. But you know, from a non-biased perspective, right? Outside of it being an outsider of your world and, and your box. What I will say is if it, the reason people love like the older stuff that you might not feel is as worthy as high rent is because it's refreshing. It, you are, it's, with your one-take videos, with the fact that, you know, you can sing, you're gifted playing different instruments, you think about music in a, diff in a different type of way, we know you can rap, so you're bringing a lot of different elements to the table, and you're finding unique sounds, you know, introducing the elements of beatboxing and stuff. So compared to, in today's era, when there's just, an oversaturation of the market of MCs, an oversaturation of an artists trying to come up and trying to make it. Like you really stand out with that creativity, right? And that, that. creativity, I've always said this, like, sure, like your skills might develop more. You might get better as a writing, your prowess as a writer and all the, the clever things you can do and shit. But what you can't always teach is creativity, right? So you've always had that creativity as an artist. And that I think that shines through no matter how far back in time we go with your music, whenever I get requests to do your stuff, like that's one thing I think that makes you so attractable to the fans and why people enjoy listening to you, man. I appreciate that, mate. Appreciate that. I saw an interesting uh, quote somewhere. I, I can't remember where. Let's see if my memory serves me right. You were talking about, because this ties in with your CNN shit, which I think is interesting. Um, Desensitized. Yeah. Hypersensitization, can I speak today? Hypersensitization versus D, save me here. Desensitization versus hypersensitization. Desensitization, why can't I get those words out right now? I'm, I'm tripping up, yeah. Desensitization versus hypersensitization yeah. within the world today. And I think uh, the CNN moment actually really encapsulates uh, the walking be between the two. But anyways, would you like to speak on that a, a little bit more and kind of how we have to deal with that as artists and how we sort of uh, approach it with our music? Yeah, I, I think uh, that it it's it's difficult. I think I think I spoke about this in an uh, interview years ago. Actually, it, it's very it's difficult um, because I think we're treading a line where because we're so sensitized by the news, by the media, by clickbait, mm. by everything that like, and we all fall victims to it. Even like. 
with, with hyperpolarization nowadays, it, it feels like it's every year it's getting a little bit worse. So whether you're sitting on the left or the right, wh whatever your views are on abortion, on vaccinations, on like all these like very like emotive topics, right? Like there's, there's my, my thing is what I really want to do is, is, is be a voice of mediation between two polar extremes. And it doesn't really even matter what I think about them. I don't think so. I don't think it really matters where on the fence I sit. It's more just like, how can we have a healthy conversation? Because, okay, taking a very controversial topic like abortion, for example, on one side, people want the freedom and domain over their own body, 100%. 100% they should have the domain over their body. On the other side, someone thinks that you are condemning a life to death and that's also very valid. You know, like, at what point is that put? And so, th this is the thing. There's two very, very sensitive and difficult topics on either side of the spectrum here and we've made it so we're in an echo chamber with our hands over our ears shouting at each other and not listening to each other's opinion so it's like how do we find a point of mediation that feels right and that feels like mm. a good conversation where even if i'm on the far right and you're on the far left we can sit in a room and we can go ah oh, i understand you and you understand me it's why i love that remember, remember that join the lucas i'm not racist video yes Beautiful. yeah absolutely Beautiful. I thought he was doing exactly the sort Beautiful of thing. Beautiful storytelling. Just, just yeah. the, the, the end of that, like so poignant, man. And I think so, so many people love that video because everyone's craving that deep down. No one wants to be, come away from a two hour long Instagram argument, like on a comment section. Yeah. We've all done it and we all feel gross after we've done it. Even, even if you've like, even if you've like schooled them and put down some opinions, you don't come away from that being like, I'm you're skipping down the street. Like I feel great. You, you just feel a bit heavy. And like, I feel like everyone really feels like that. So like, finding these points of mediation. And in terms of hypersensitization versus desensitization, it's like we're so hypersensitized because we've been trained to like have these really emotional, visceral responses. Yeah, so knee-jerk reactions to yeah. everything online. And but then yeah, we're, we're also paradoxically... Really echoes. Exactly, but mm. when we're paradoxically hypersensitized because we're shown so much violence, we're shown so mm. much like... It's, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it and my, and my music does the same thing but we are so subject to like so much information from the internet these days that we can see anything you, you can watch someone being beheaded on uh, online if you search like enough and it's just like it's it we're so desensitized that it's like so as an artist because we've seen so much um you, people are either going to get really outraged or they're just going to be completely apathetic and it's like to yeah. be a, to be an artist in that environment is is an unusual it's, thing because it, you, it's wild and then you have like cnn ironically using hyper polarized clickbait to talk about the dangers of you know desensitizing children and young teens on tiktok so there's that position of that right there beautifully but, ironic know, man yeah yeah <laughs> and obviously i covered it you covered it but yeah i mean again how how so how this is how the world is right now and it is crazy it's like one extreme to the other so how do you how do you find that that common ground to bring people together through the music very very quickly it just popped into my head as well then i'll answer that question the um Go on. the the other thing i think that we're facing is attention spans because we're we're creating so much short mm. we're creating so much short form content that that's why i think everything is yeah and again an antithesis to that a fucking nine minute long music video with only one location yeah do you know what i mean yeah, like you're fucking crazy like what what is wrong with you for doing that well that, that's the thing and I, it's like i, I want to do something like that because they're doing it in cinema and music music isn't as being as ballsy that they're, they're doing it that there, there are some scenes in so in some um like there was some really good scenes in better call soul i, I don't know if you watched that but it was i, I mm. the reason i liked it, it was more subtle than breaking bad but there was some really like drawn out scenes and i was like i love this because it's so like it's so human like this is actually real life. Yeah. whereas we're being we're being like fast food food like swipe swipe video swipe board of this one next one like the same with music you go into a spotify playlist and listen to 10 seconds ago nah not my vibe next song and it's like so what what is the antidote to that but then um yeah so so i think we were also battling that as well partly yeah i mean re reaction channels for instance like when i started my channel the only channels i saw were short form content you know people making faces maybe they'll say a couple words and that's it and all of a sudden i come in and i start breaking down shit for like 20 30 sometimes 40 minutes and i have so many people commenting like i got bored i clicked off you pause way too much you talk way too much but i just kept doing it i, I yeah. didn't listen i'm like i think there's going to be people somewhere out there who are going to appreciate this yeah. and the more that i kept growing the more that that quality kind of started to find me and 
you know, we've we've kind of slowly grown and continued to grind and, and climb from there. And it seems, yeah, there's there's an audience for it. Yeah, but, that's why know, I love those... fighting fighting the ADHD generation now. As somebody with <laughs> severe ADHD, and I'm um, also as well the um, I love those. Uh, do you watch Lax Fridman podcasts? He's like an engineer. No. Ru- Russian. No. Oh, he's, they're so good got as well. Some, got something you got to recommend to me, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. They're re- they're really really good. What, um, what is he? Sorry, Lex Fridman. Repeat that to me. L- 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 Lex Fridman. And I think it's F R I D, F R I D M A N. But yeah, he's really good. He he did one with um with he he was one of the lucky people to uh, get Kanye in the midst of all of that controversy. Um, on really? That, that's that's a very. Oh, I bet that's one. interesting. Yeah. Should we um should we shoot on a on a new um? Yep. Yep. Link, Looks like we'll do we'll do we'll, one more. We'll just do, do one, one more and wrap it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how how do we do that as as musicians? How do we find, you know, that that common uniting ground in such a hyper polarized world of team choosing in one side versus the other side. Mm. So I think it's about, I think it's about being careful about the subject matters. So something like high rent, right, is it's not really saying anything too far on any one side of the fence. We're talking about mm. humanity. We're talking about the inner critic, no matter who, yeah. no matter who you are, whether you grew up rich in poverty, uh, in an area of great privilege, in an area of great prejudice, like we we are all victims of ourselves uh, at some point mm. in our lives, and so that's find, a great quote. Yeah, uh, and to to find a point of common ground is just is a, an excellent place to start building a bridge, and I think that it's crucial that we start to build those bridges in any opportunity that we have, because I think that hyperpolarization it's the enemy of truth, because mm. all of a sudden you don't know what's true and the truth has actually become secondary as less important than us being right and our opinions being right. Yeah. And, and when that exactly. happens, when that happens, we suffer because um, we should all, I think ultimately on the left, on the right, whatever, we should be striving towards the thing that makes us the most comfortable and also that ensures the greatest possibility for a comfortable future for the survival yeah. of our species that should be an over you know like i was saying about an overarching theme of an album and and like this yeah. is this is what i want the sentiment to be i feel like in any decision humans make that should be the overriding before before we make an exam it's like it's like trickling down you know like f- you know like first principles theory elon musk works a lot with that it's like you break it down until you get to the very the very like most purified part of the source it's like yeah i feel like the most purified overarching thing should be like how do we with these decisions is this going to make collectively the human experience better in the future Mm. and is this collectively going to ensure that we have a longer future and survival as a species and um and so those questions should really come down come down to every question we 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 make be it pollution be it um what we're doing to the natural kingdom be it any of those things to to look at it not in a biased way because there is a lot of bias in it and 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 they manipulate so much data even stuff like humans carbon footprint you do some digging that was actually pushed by the oil company to make human to make the individual away from the oil company feel responsible for them polluting the planet rather than these big oil companies right so like that there's a lot um I think that any time that these decisions, which I, the thing is, with my song like Money Game about realizing the hypocrisy of it all, when you step back, I also know that I'm a contributor of this. So it's like, uh, and for me to point the blame at too many places is actually me being a bit of a hypocrite. So it's like, how do we create a system whereby, um, because ultimately, say, say this this company this big corporate company becomes the biggest corp company in the world yeah they get all the power they 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 are the top they can make all of these big fundamental decisions that trickle down through parliament that trickle down through governments and they have ultimate power F- what then what then if the, the future of the human race is screwed because we're 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 messing up the habitat that we live or or, or if we're making decisions that aren't based on how can we improve our future as human beings and i, I think like fundamentally Every decision that we really need to make has to has to ask that question first. I mean, not not the point where it's exhausting, like every little micro interaction, because we're we're clumsy beings. We can't live perfectly, like, and we never will. Um, but but if we kind of make that the main narrative between these big decisions, I think we're doing ourselves as a species a great service. Really do. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, unfortunately, there are a lot of selfish people in the world. There are a lot of short-sighted people that, whether it's because of fear or 
greed or other circumstances, they just kind of get tunnel vision and they focus instead on the future of our human race, yeah. kind of the here and, and the now. So, and my, so my question, which I've never been able to answer it is, uh, is it nature or nurture? Like, is greed an inherent mm. biological human behavior or is it one born from our environment and are, are those things inseparable? Is our environment there because of our inherent biology? It's a very difficult mm. question. It just keeps on going back. It's a chicken and egg question. Um, so, so it, it, yeah, but... I think because I feel like this very strongly and I have for my whole life, I feel almost a responsibility to try and relay that within the music that I've had. And I feel like mm. I feel like music, you know, the story of Tro uh, Tr uh, Trojan Horse, the story of Troy. I feel like music's such a good Trojan Horse to be able to deliver your idea of, of, of what you think is good. And uh, and coming back to this hyperpolarization... I like that concept. Mm, uh, com coming back to this hyperpolarization thing, I think that, like, everyone really deep down we just want to feel happy like we do, we just want to feel good and, and it really frustrates me when i take a bird's eye view of this and being like we're we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by this constant like me versus you i, I and we really yeah. we really drill that in with with elections we really drill that in with because everyone's trying to push those emotional buttons and these politicians are talking about topics that they know are going to get people riled up because that's how you get support mm. that's how you get more um support in the poll so it's it's really like for me, it's like, how do we, how do I as an artist try and offer an antidote to this where people can step away from it and feel the humanity and not feel this like constant clashing polarization? Because Well, it, especially too trying to be independent, which means we already have so many factors and odds against us. We don't have a huge marketing team. You know, we, we don't have a lot of the assets that a label artist has. So how do you stand out? And there's definitely that temptation and that pull to go, We'll give in to the hyperpolarization. Sure. We'll give in to be super controversial, you know, and that's kind of diluting your own message in a sense then because it's like, well, now you're using this hyperpolarization to promote your own music, but yet you still want to critique it and do that. A so hundred percent, man. It's why I like, you know, so so coming back to Animal Farm, like, you know, the 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 um the, the story where they they overthrow the humans because of they're sick of the inequality. But then, mm. but then you have uh, you, you have overthrowing, um, uh, the, then creating a hierarchy of corruption within that. He, I think he, uh, if, it was a while ago that I read it, but he let, he lets the horse, who's like his most loyal like servant, mm. a friend, he puts him down because he's too old to work, and it's like it's just yeah. gotten it's gotten so corrupt that 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 it's yeah. just. Uh, uh, and and that's the, that's the thing and and that's that's the thing that terrifies me is that like you're you're kind of working out as you go because i i can see that there's something inherently wrong but i'm so nervous about the biological nature of humankind that i'm like what what's the solution what have i got to offer but maybe i because i don't know i'm one i'm one person all i can see all i can see is fault and i think that's why when it comes down to like these songs like money game like the overall sentiments of of the, of the chorus when it's like point the mirror at ourselves it's e it's easy to point the blame but we're all part of it and and it's like that noticing Absolutely. that in myself and being like you know i'm not i'm not somebody with the answers at all and and that's quite a scary prospect for me but i also just think there's a lot that can be said for just coming back to the the good in humanity the, yeah. the, the, and, and, well, and you, you you don't have to know all the answers in order to see the problem mm, yeah you don't have to have all of all of the solutions. And I think there's there's an empowerment, especially from your music, in taking that accountability. Because then that makes people connect with you more. Because it goes, you know, yeah, I'm I'm human. Like mm. I'm not standing here on a soapbox speaking down to anybody. I'm no. speaking to us all equally. And I'm not even I'm not even necessarily criticizing ways of like because a lot of people have been like, yeah, but capitalism works right and i'm like i'm not an anti-capitalist i actually i actually think that money as a form of trade is a good idea and i, and I think that in, yeah. i think that in there's a reason why money was invented i mean yeah yeah, yeah. And, and i think that in, i think that proportional incentive to work obviously it, it's become com complicated and you could be argued that it's not proportional but I, I think that having incentives to work harder or to make yourself more ambitious that capitalism makes Nothing sense that. yeah exactly yeah. so so it's, it's not even so much anti-capitalism it's just more just coming down to like it's really just because I think all of these systems can because even like communism on the surface sounds like a good idea. And then in its actual practical applications, it's been totally like just totally <laughs> run with. And um, the, the, the examples of, of functional communism haven't been great. Like you look at the look no. at the past. Do you know what I mean? No. So and, and I guess they, I guess the difference is that capitalism and communism 
in terms of ideology, fantastic ideas for human and societal systems, mm. right? Humans then intervene. <laughs> the We've never is- gotten a functioning form of communism. We've totally yeah. fucked that up. Yeah. You can blame Stalin and Lenin for that. But anyways, that's a different day. Mm. And then capitalism, we at least got a functioning system from it. Mm. But still, humans have found ways to mess that up as well from yeah. its original and ideology. I, and, I, and I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the system. I think that we like to try and simplify things too much and go, yeah, but if you don't think this, then look at this. Like, like, yeah. like the, the second you criticize somebody, someone goes, yeah, well, this if, if this doesn't work, look at the alternatives. And it's like, it, it, it's more about just making these things quite fluid, really, and, and just trying, mm. to, and trying to think about better ways to do things through collective intelligence. The, the internet, again, is a tool, double-edged sword, but it, it, it's positivity that it can, um, like, gift to the world is that we are now more, cu- like, interconnected than ever. And the power of collective intelligence to be able to make, like, very clever democratic crack decisions using the smartest minds now using ai like of our time to to make decisions that are aren't based on it's i think when when it's like a profit-based decision i think that there's there's pluses and negatives to that as well but wh- when it when it's based on that overarching principle that i said to you i think that we will would benefit massively from that as a, I know, I know it's a it's a very like sort of utopian sort of mindset but i think that there needs to be people that think like that sometimes as well like it might be a little bit oh yeah the world's not that lovely a bit i still think it could be man i do you're an idealist yeah of course you're an man. idealist in a in a real world but yeah. we need more of those honestly if more people thought that way i think this world would uh be a much better place for it and it it also sounds to me like I think when you're hit with this philosophical dilemma and you start really thinking deeper about the systems under which we operate you ultimately you have well let's call it three choices one is you just bury your head in the sand and you just keep going and just stop thinking about it and just function within that society two you go against it you rebel against it and you try to change it externally or three you you accept that you are just as flawed as the system is and then you try to find ways to change it internally and it sounds to me like your music and kind of just your persona and outlook towards life reflect that third option of you know it, I, look i'm not trying to burn down every single bridge here i'm trying to find the positives in a productive way for us all to thrive as a society and move forward and just bring us together and, and think about our future and humanity and the human race yeah it's a, it's a point of mediation because if, if people start to mediate and collaborate and use collective intelligence like i don't need to have any answers at all because we've all got them collectively like people's mm. people's problem solving skills are amazing um it's what it's why like dur- during the big what's it it's like voldemort the, the the thing that must be named during the pandemic when when everyone was so hyper polarized about um the vaccinations again it it, it it was the same sort of thing and, and and my opinion on that doesn't really matter where where i stand on it because i, th- I think that both schools of thought there was a lot of merit to both schools of thought uh, uh, that what i found really sad about the pandemic was i think it was a real opportunity for us to go as a species we are here unified in the force in in this you know it's like independence day where the the, the aliens yeah. come and we're like right we've got a real opportunity to regardless to of, unite, unite. We've, we, we've got to overcome this situation somehow yeah, yeah this like, is a this is a global situation it's not going yeah. away anytime soon and i think what was really heartbreaking for me about that is that the hyper polarization that it birthed towards the the fallout and coming out of that was mm. quite extreme because because i think that the, the the narrative of of where you stood on the fence with the vaccinations and um a, a it lo- like defined your entire character mm, and, and, you and, know and, people uh, made judgment calls based on just your feeling of vaccination no vaccination mass no mass like that was that was like your identifier it yeah was and, and I, i'm i'm just i don't think i don't really think i know this is quite a bold thing to say i don't really think it mattered where you stood on it i think that the most overarching thing was more like why is this dividing us so much i think that was the most important thing that people weren't really talking about during that time yeah. um like what why like uh, and and it was because i think that that was a real opportunity that that we maybe missed out on and, and I, I would hope that we would um, make the most maybe it wasn't bad enough because the way the way that i see it is is like you keep on taking cookies out of the cookie jar like yeah. you're, you're you're gonna eventually be like oh where's the cookies and, and and i feel like we're we're really like we're getting to a point now where there are natural things that are happening there are uh, the weaknesses in our infrastructures of society are becoming more obvious and and it really needs to become a time where we're like 
it, it's like prevention is better than a there cure, right? There has to be a turning point. There, there, there pre- has to be kind of a pre- wake Prevention point is better than a cure, but I think, point. yeah, prevention is, yeah. is better than a cure, but I think that we're so like monofocused that it's probably going to take something quite... It's going to take the cure. It's going to take the it, cure. Absolutely. Take There's no quite, way we're going to do prevention the, I think the rate we're, we're going. And, and it's sad, but I think that it's going to take something that's going to make us suffer quite a lot to... Cha- the, the, the positive of that there's there's a um, line in a Red Hot Chili Peppers song that goes destruction leads to a very rough road but it also breeds creation love that line yeah. but, it's, but it's, I, f- I feel like it, it, maybe this is a bit of like an ominous like prophecy but I feel like we, we um, maybe will need to go through something quite severe for us to go yeah. like, we need to start working together we need to start focusing on what's important which is our survival I agree and again looping back to the hyperpolarization every of everything you have a situation like this that should in theory unite us and bring us together against a common enemy and have a common goal but instead all this over sensationalization just divides us further yeah and you know we're, social media can be a beautiful thing this interconnected world can be a beautiful thing it can also be a very dark thing as well and you know there's always pros and cons to everything so going on to to social media and question I'm curious about because you know being an artist myself and dealing with a lot of these things uh unfortunately I could tell that you are an overthinker uh and uh you you go through a lot a lot of these concepts uh you go through a lot of these emotions obviously you empathize with a lot too being an artist how do you deal with this more introverted mind right and probably nature of of putting a lot on yourself overthinking all these things and yet you have to exist and your job is putting yourself out there all the time yeah. and being incredibly extroverted. And also normally, you know, like we're doing interviews right now and stuff. It's not like you could come on this interview and you might be thinking of some deep shit. And you might be a little down and you can't sit here on in an interview and just be kind of like this and what's going on, guys. And I got a new song today. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we, we almost have this polarity amongst ourselves as artists because we have to be incredibly external. Yeah. Well, a lot going on internally. I mean, how do you how do you find balance to that force? I guess the, the, this is like one of my favorite bits of advice that I ever got, and it, I can relate it to this. Like, it was um back when I was really ill, and I was um it was the first time that I'd I was I'd, I'd I'd gotten myself kind of well enough to be in Brighton, but not well enough to really leave my room. But I wanted independence from my mum. Um, uh, not in any slight because I think my mum's amazing. I think that like what she put up with, like she is one of uh, a force that I'm so grateful for in my life to like be in there to house me and, and look after me when I was really sick and she she saw me go through my worst phases and she was really dead but mm. but there was a point where I was like you know for my own like spirit I needed my own independence and I got I got back to Brighton and I was living with this guy Ben who's this amazing guy um just like really creative but works in the theater and I was like talking about like oh you know I want to get on the street and do some busking again but I was like I've been I hadn't performed for so long that I was like I just had performance anxiety and I was like I've never had this Ben like I was like, I, I don't know, like, I'm just so nervous about getting out there again. And he was like, he was like, when I, he just gave me this advice and, and it can be applied to situations like this. He was just like, it's you are, it, it's almost like, it, it sounds depreciating, but it's not. It's like, you're not really important in that, in that scenario. The important thing mm. are the people who are watching you or the people or the message you're trying to give away or a feeling. If you're trying to make people happy, which which your your song as well, um, then it's not really about you. It's not really about, you need to stop thinking like, how am I being perceived? And, and you need to start thinking about, is that person having a good time? And and I think when when I ch- when you take the lens off yourself and I stop worrying about me, how I'm coming across, if I'm going to be, oh, if, if if something I said was clumsy or not, because if I start thinking like that, it's just, I don't know, it's it's really self sabotaging. So I think it could be applied yeah. to social media. It's like, even on days where I'm like, oh, I don't feel like promoting my song today. I'm just like, it's I I think that it's more important that especially now that there's like even more people watching, like. It, it, if I'm serving a lot of people and making for taking like an hour, two hours out of my day to chat to you, to, to post something on Facebook, to share a song, to do something like that, that might even just to reshare something that I've repurposed that I've made like a year ago, like, and somebody sees that and it cheers them up. Then like that small action that I've taken has impacted a lot of people. Um, maybe superficially, maybe quite profoundly. I don't know. I don't, I'm not really in control of how it happens, but thinking of that as more important than me, 
and what I've got to gain, that really helps me with that because then like, mm. I'm just like, and then also it makes, it has this paradoxical effect of making me feel better anyway because like today I was even mm. like, I woke up and I was like really foggy headed and I was like, oh man, I've got to speak for like a couple of hours with Knox. I hope I don't come across like a twat and I was just like, yeah, it's, th- th- then I've got to remind myself. I'm just like, you know, it's, this is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, it's, more, it's more important that, that it's, yeah, that's, that's it really. I'm not perfect at that, mate, like, because I still have days where, like, I'm dreading doing something and, and even while I'm doing it, I dread it. Um, right, we, we all do. We, we all go through it, man. Trust me. You know, like, I, I got to put out content every single day on top of being an artist, you know, being a reactor as well. So I have to bring my energy. And obviously I've created an expectation level because people expect me being at my best mentally processing things as quickly as I can, concising down my analysis, giving it to them, pitching it to them and and doing it in that way. And yeah, I mean, you know, so many days where I'm like down, but I, I think you're right. That's, that's a great fucking point and sentiment. And I think for any artist out there watching, uh, it's not just about us. No. It's about the people that are here now on this journey with us and this community that we're trying to nurture and, and build. And, you know, that is one of the, you know, we're selfish, okay? As artists, we're selfish because obviously we, we want attention. We are attention seekers. We we want to play to the high, largest crowd possible. We want as many people to hear our music. So there's For that sure. selfishness. But at the same time, we're incredibly unselfish as well because, well, artists that really want to have a message that, empowers people that want to leave a positive outlook and try to leave the world a better place than how we found it because we want people to walk away with something better something different i think i think what a lot of people can't relate to in this this position as well like you're my position is so so sometimes say like i'll 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 look through my my instagram inbox or message inbox or whatever and i'll get a message and i'll it'll be a message i haven't seen for a year and then another one and it's like you're so arrogant you haven't replied to me um, and it'll just be like abuse, and I'm just like, or, or someone, and, and I'm just like, pe- what people don't realize, I think, in in our situation is we have to communicate with people more than anybody else. Like, there's literally yeah. today, if I look through my like 24 hours inbox, it's like there's there's probably about four or five hundred messages from different people. I'm probably gonna look at about one percent of that. But when people start yeah. like d- demanding your attention, that's that's when that's that's I get a lot more overwhelmed than that with the, trying to put out content. It's just like because I'm just like fuck you i'm just like honestly that's how i feel because I'm, I'm i'm just a little bit like you don't understand what it what it means to be like i'm trying to like give so much of myself to uplift people and then people are like you are not giving me attention i want your yeah. attention because i said something and, and even though i'm I'm always appreciative of like of a nice comment or something nice that's being said to me and i try and read and respond in the best way that i can but because there's so much of it i wouldn't have any time to make music if i was just a people no. communicator do you get me no so, what they what what they watch you for it, it's ironic because what they critique you for is it's the same reason why they watch you like if if all of a sudden i spend all of my time to responding to every single message on this inbox right respond to every single email and just you know every other fucking place that people are talking to me i'm not going to get time to make content no, and the whole point it. is people want to see the content and yeah, to yeah. me you know it's it's more efficient because when i'm at my best making this content people get the greatest enjoyment and i can reach the most people well, that's out the, of it that's the thing you're you're going you're going you're actually going to make e- even though but but you know say you're saying that i do i do try to every now and then when when i can but yeah i think that's, oh oh, that's, oh, oh, that's, oh that's, me too me too i like I, I always try to set aside time to respond and actually when i'm at my lowest that's when I really turn to like kind of the inbox and, you know, scroll through the mean and all yeah, the hate because yeah. that just comes with the territory. But then but then you get those amazing comments you know, that just like yeah. remind you and center you of why you're doing what you do when you can just inspire like that one person and have an impact on their life. And you're like, yep, that's exactly why I'm fucking doing what I'm doing. And then you just keep going from there. Yeah. for real. Can I ask you a question? Because <sighs> go on. So. so because I'm always really interested about this. Because you know, so cause, cause if, if, if same thing, if you grew up in like a poor area, because you you strike me as someone like very like with your analysis, yeah, you see you seem like very very well educated, and I wonder if that is that f- comes from your self inspired desire to learn, curiosity. Would you say your knowledge? I've, I've I've always been curious, but all right. So the the thing is, from where I'm from. One of the things that always kept me out of trouble compared to like some of the kids I grew up with that are now either dead or in jail was besides music, I also had sports. So I was Uh also an athlete. So I was I was a really good athlete. I was good enough that, you know, I was offered scholarships to go play at university. So I got to go pursue a higher education 
thanks to sports. But that always kept me out of trouble. It kept me focused. It gave me something to do. And then actually, ironically, when, when I got hurt and had a really bad injury, that's when music really saved me from that darkness. Because all of a sudden, I was doubting my future and my career on this side of things. But I've always loved music. I've always created. I've always read a lot. I've always written. So I, I think it's a combination of, of education, but also just curiosity. Like I read every single day. I, I'm always studying. I'm always, I, I'm just so curious about the world and there's just so much to learn and not enough time to learn it. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a, a combination nice. of those things. Nice. Does that yeah, make sense? No, yeah. I was, I was, just, I was just interested. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like that. I'm like, I'll open the fridge and I'll be like, how the hell does this keep like <laughs> stuff cold? And then I'll just like Google yeah. it and then I'll just be trying to figure it out. But that's it. And then, yeah. and then you were gone on a fucking scientific journey after that, that, that happens to me all the time. Like I, I have so many notes and so many things like trying to <laughs> remind me to stay on track because I do, I do struggle with that. It's so easy for me to get curious about something. And yeah. then we are on a journey and hours later, it's like, what the fuck was I doing today? <laughs> You're like, you're like, oh yeah, I've just been standing by the fridge for 20 minutes. So, oh, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> dude, dude, I'm sure you have plenty of moments when you're like going to do something and then you have a different thought or maybe an idea or something creative happens and like you just totally forget what the fuck you're doing. And oh, then, like, yeah. No, yeah, no. <laughs> like, like my, my wife will walk in and I'll have like something in my hand or like something spilling and she's like, what the, what are you doing now? And I'm like, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, man, that's the story of my life, mate. <laughs> fuck yeah, man. Listen, man, I think uh, I think this is a good ending point here. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, man. Is there uh, is there anything you want to leave with with our audience uh, to to sign off with after after our wonderful mental journey and musical? Yeah, journey? well, don't know. This, this is this has been a good one, man. Um, no, I, I think the thing the sentiment is, it's, I think it's the first time I spoke about um, like really the details of everything that happened with Joe. So I just like to dedicate it to Joe, man. Like he's one hundred percent, man. I think that's. Sure. Um, well, yeah, that that's that's it really, and, and also another a really close friend of mine, Callum Mackay, who's well, he passed away six months later as well. Just just very set for different sort of circumstances, but um, yeah, like like the, those the, there's there's people that I'll always carry with me, um, that also made me who I am as well. So like, uh, yeah, a lot, yeah. Of, a lot of things that I and they're always here, and you know, e even though you haven't written about it in their music, they're still with you in every single song that you put out and everything that you do. And yes, I'm man. Sure they're wherever they are man they're they're happy for you yeah i hope and so man i hope so respect man all right man thanks a lot